Order. And now call uh, the meeting to order. This is the committee, the, the standing committee on public accounts. Uh, my name is Kelly Regan. I'm the chair of this committee. Um, so just some reminders before we start, please keep your video on during the meeting. Uh, keep your mics muted until you are uh, called upon to speak. Uh, wait until after the chair recognizes you to unmute your mic. And this is one of the hard parts is do, do please wait to be uh, recognized uh, before you begin to speak and indicate your wish to speak by raising your hand. I want to remind everyone to place their phones on, on vibrate or silent uh, before we get, begin. And so I'll ask committee members now to introduce themselves, beginning with Mr. Young. Good morning, everyone. Nolan Young, um, MLA for Shelburne County. Mr. Ritzy. Morning, everyone. Dave Ritzy, MLA for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook and Salmon River. Mr. McDonald. Good morning, everyone. John A. McDonald, MLA, Hans East. Ms. Sheehy Richard. Good morning, everyone. I'm Melissa Sheehy Richard, the MLA for Hans West. Mr. Boudreau. Good morning, everyone. Trevor Boudreau, MLA for Richmond. The Honorable McGu uh, Brendan McGuire. Good morning, everyone. Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Ms. Chender. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Claudia Chender, MLA for Dartmouth South. And Ms. LeBlanc. Good morning, everyone. Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Thank you. 
So on today's agenda, we have officials with us from the Department of Health and Wellness, Emergency Medical Care Incorporated, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 727, and the Nova Scotia Health Authority to discuss emergency health services contract and services delivery and service delivery. So I'm going to ask the witnesses to introduce themselves again, beginning with Associate Deputy Minister Beaton. Good morning, everyone. Craig Beaton, Associate Deputy Minister, Department of Health and Wellness. Uh, Dr. Andrew Travers. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andrew Travers. I'm the Provincial Medical Director for EHS, but also a staff physician at the Halifax Emergency Department. Uh, Charbel Daniel. Good morning, everyone. My name is Charbel Daniel. I'm the Executive Director of Provincial Operations with uh, EHS. Uh, uh, Ms. Jensen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jan Jensen. I'm Executive Director of Medical Communications, Patient Flow and System Performance for EHS Operations Emergency Medical Care. Mr. McMullen. Mr. McMullen, we can't hear you. There we go. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everyone. Forgot to unmute, the, unmute my mic. I'm Kevin McMullen. I'm the business manager, CEO of the IUOE Local 727, the paramedics union. And I'm also a registered paramedic in Nova Scotia. Thank you. Mr. Nickerson. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Nickerson, and I'm a business agent for IUOE 727, the union representing Nova Scotia paramedics. Ms. Hamilton. Good morning. I'm Samantha Hamilton. I'm a paramedic um, in Middleton. Uh, I'm also the president uh, with the IUOE 727. Ms. Sullivan. Um, yes, my name is Vicki Sullivan. I'm the vice president of operations for Central Zone of the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Thank you. So at this time, I will invite Deputy Minister Beaton to make his remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning to discuss the EHS contract and service delivery. I, I want to thank you and our guests for joining us today. Each witness brings to the table a different role and perspective to some of the challenges facing our emergency health system. But we were all committed to ensuring better care for Nova Scotians, and we are committed to working together to bring forward improvements. We know there are significant challenges, and certainly the pandemic has put even more pressure on our system. Many of these challenges are long-standing, complex issues that not only our counterparts in provinces across the country are facing, but around the globe as well. Our system needs to be more responsive, modern, and efficient. Through the department's most recent contract with EMCI, we made bold and significant changes to enable redesign of emergency response system to provide the right resource to the right person at the right time for the right reason. These changes were validated and informed by global best practices outlined in the Fitch report the department released last year. The report outlined 68 recommendations of which the department committed to accepting 64. Some of these 64 recommendations were already implemented when the report was released. And as noted earlier, some were included in the new contract with the MC. Some needed to be evaluated further on how to implement and many are currently underway, such as installing power stretchers and loaders to improve patient safety and, para and pan paramedic injury prevention. I want to acknowledge the excellent care paramedics and all EHS staff provide to Nova Scotians. They have been at the forefront of caring for patients throughout the pandemic and have adapted to changing roles and processes when COVID-19 called for it over the last two years. I think everyone here will agree that paramedics are one of the most collaborative health professionals out there. It's that teamwork and collaboration that has helped us and will continue to help us while working with Nova Scotia Health, EMCI, and the Paramedics Union to address some of these long-standing complex problems. I want to take a minute to speak directly to paramedics working on the front lines. We know at times you've worked harder than anticipated and longer. You have missed tucking in loved ones at night or seeing them before they leave for school and work. You are giving the best of yourselves when Nova Scotians need you the most. And you've done all of this and more to help those in need of emergency care. I want you to know that together with our partners, we are working to increase the provincial supply of paramedics and to get you the support you need. It's been, it's been an incredibly challenging time for the entire health system. So thank you for all that you've done and continue to do. 
I also want to thank all of my colleagues from the IUOE 727, EMC, and the NSH for their hard work, dedication, and efforts to work collaboratively to find innovative solutions for our current challenges and to keep our communities safe. Thank you. Thank you. Then from emergency medical care, um, Mr. Daniel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the loss of a number of longstanding Nova Scotia paramedics since the start of the pandemic, including the most recent loss of Yarmouth paramedic Terry Muse, who along with others was a great mentor, leader, and clinician. For over two decades, EMC has worked closely as a health system partner with EHS of the Department of Health and Wellness, Nova Scotia Health, the IWK, medical first responder agencies, employee unions, and others to provide emergency pre-hospital care as part of Nova Scotia's health and emergency response systems. EMC is very proud and thankful for our team of more than 1,500 clinicians. These are highly trained paramedics, nurses, and communication officers who work closely with leaders and support staff and over 3,500 medical first responders to provide emergency care for Nova Scotians. The EHS system has long been the safety net for Nova Scotia's healthcare system, providing care for patients in the community, as well as setting up collaborative and innovative programs to fill gaps in the system. Today, EHS faces unprecedented challenges, both health system and human resource strains. We no longer have that same ability to flex and fill these gaps. And this has impacted our service delivery to the public and our employees. Mm -hmm. We know Nova Scotians and our team members are concerned about our ability to respond in a timely manner, and we're listening. We know paramedics are not getting their lunches and are missing time with their families due to shift overruns, causing hardship on the job and at home. We continue to work with our partners on immediate solutions. Never has there been a more important time for a collaborative approach among all stakeholders and a willingness to work together to implement solutions. We know this challenge is not unique to Nova Scotia or even Canada. We are, however, optimistic about the steps government has taken to improve communication, collaboration, and accountability in the healthcare system. One of the guiding principles of our relationship with EHS is providing the right resource for the right patient at the right time. This principle has led to the development of several innovative programs, such as the extended care paramedics in Halifax caring for seniors in nursing homes. Paramedics that have been trained to provide palliative care in the comfort of a patient's own home, if that's their wish. And our community-based paramedic program in Cape Breton that supports patients recently discharged from the regional hospital to recover at home, and has also recently expanded into long-term care facilities. We're also making operational changes to enhance coverage in all communities across Nova Scotia, while focusing on improving the work environment for our employees. We continue to add more EHS unit hours and are currently having our deployment system reviewed. We continue to expand on our patient transfer side with increasing patient transfer hours, uh, a new delivery service called the medical transport service that provides patients with a, a different method of transport, further collaboration and integration with our health system and, and the Nova Scotia Health to ease offload delays and increase patient flow. We've also introduced a physician into our medical communication center and we'll be adding a nurse to help navigate low acuity calls and identify appropriate alternative care pathways. We've redesigned our internal leadership model and we continue to listen to the valuable feedback we receive from our teams, employee unions and others as we build our employee advisory group to help navigate the future of the MS. The EHS ground critical care and medical communications programs have all been accredited and reaccredited for many years. These independent accreditations provide external validation of the high quality care provided by our EHS clinicians. However, the EHS system is under-resourced and strained right now, and we are working on solutions. On behalf of our entire team, I want Nova Scotians to know that EHS operations team is laser focused on providing and ensuring the right patient, the right resource for the right patient at the right time. Thank you to all our employees for their work that they provide excellent pre-hospital care and critical care to Nova Scotians. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Daniel. And now from IUOE, Mr. Nickerson. S sorry, Mr. McMillan. McMullen. 
Thank you, Kelly. And Ed. First off, good morning. And thank you for inviting me here today on behalf of Nova Scotia's paramedics and life flight RNs. Um, I worked as a paramedic in the field for 42 years before moving into my new role in December past of 2021. As the union representing this critical workforce, we're concerned. Working conditions continue to deteriorate with constant missed meals, shift overruns, denied vacations, extended response times, and so much more. They're mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausted. For years, we have been calling for change and ringing the alarm bells on a system in crisis. I reviewed uh, a video on Monday that was taken three years ago, and it just it's a repeat of what we're doing today, and that's three years later. Today, the system is nearing the point of failure. We became paramedics to help Nova Scotians. When we see calls in the queue with no units available to respond, or we are dispatched from the CBRM to calls in Choro and Dartmouth, like was reported to us on December 30th of 2021, that takes a serious mental and emotional toll on our members and puts Nova Scotians at risk. How many more news articles do we need to see of stories from Nova Scotians who waited and waited and waited for an ambulance while their loved ones suffered in front of them? Nova Scotians are struggling. It's time that we all work together and put an end to it. We believe Premier Houston and this government were elected on one particular promise, a promise to fix health care. We were happy to see this government take a very important step towards that promise with the offering of a 20 to 25% raise to CCAs. That's very important to them and well-deserved. A similar increase for paramedics would do a lot to alleviate st staffing pressures, in turn helping to improve working conditions. Our paramedics are some of the most highly skilled and trained in North America, and yet they're some of the lowest paid. It's easy to say, it's easy to see why we are bleeding paramedics to other professions and other jurisdictions. The time for action is now. Before it's too late, Nova Scotians and our paramedics deserve better. Thank you, Mr. Nickerson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, committee members, fellow witnesses, good morning, and thank you for having me here today. Again, my name is Michael Nickerson, and I'm a business agent for IUE 727, the union that represents Nova Scotia paramedics and life flight RNs. Before that, I was a paramedic for 18 years. I know the horrendous conditions that our paramedics are facing on a daily basis. Mr. Daniel alluded to some of them earlier. It, it's time that we work together to find a solution as uh, my business manager pointed out, we did something similar three years ago. Enough is enough. We need to come together and work together to find solutions. I look forward to hearing your questions and providing insight and feedback. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Sullivan, did you want to make any opening remarks? Uh, yes, please, Kelly. Um, good morning and thank you to the committee for having us here today. All are aware that our emergency departments have been under pressure for years. In the past 12 months, we have seen much greater strain with increasing staff vacancies and patient volumes combined with high occupancy rates. This has been exacerbated over the past two months with the impact of the Omicron COVID-19 right across our health system. So I want to begin by thanking our staff and physicians who continue to put our patients first, working tirelessly to find solutions to the challenges we have and continue to face daily. We are truly humbled by their dedication, perseverance, innovation and teamwork, and it is our privilege as leaders to work with them. Our partners across the health sector have seen similar strain due to COVID. Our collaboration with EHS is critical to the operations of the health system in Nova Scotia and the flow of patients through that system. The QE2 emergency department in Halifax is the busiest in the province. And since the QE2 is a specialty hospital for all of Nova Scotia, what happens there can affect services in inside and outside of hospitals across the province. Recognizing this, we have been working with government and EHS on strategies to address the delays 
that see paramedics unfortunately having to wait to transfer care of patients to the emergency department. A transition team was put in place at the QE2 emergency department late last summer and now operates 24 hours a day. Staffed now by a registered nurse and a paramedic who can support offloading of ambulance patients from EHS staff and work under the direction of an emergency department physician. A preliminary analysis showed this was having an impact. While offload times continue to exceed the target of 30 minutes or less, 90% of the time, in the period from September to December, data did show a 17% reduction in offload time at the QE2 emergency department compared to our previous two years. However, we have seen offload times increase again with the current COVID surge. Our partnership with EHS is not limited to the emergency departments. We depend on EHS to move people between hospitals, sometimes for a consultation or procedure at a larger facility, and then back to their point of origin, and sometimes to bring patients who are getting more acutely ill to the facility best suited to meet their needs. We work closely with EHS to schedule and prioritize these transfers, recognizing that delayed transfers can mean beds required by admitted patients in our emergency departments are, no, are not available. We are pleased with the success EHS has had with expanding the use of the dedicated pa patient transfer units and its medical transport service pilot. Expanding their ability to transport non-emergency patients while also freeing up emergency units to provide that care in the community. EHS will also be a partner as we roll out the Nova Scotia Health Command Centre, an innovative approach to access and flow that will be using predictive and analytics to improve decision making and streamline patient flow. The initial command centre will be located at the QE2. The vision is that operations will expand to central zone facilities within the next few months and then scale province wide in the future. I want to assure committee members and the public that all of us at Nova Scotia Health and our partners have prioritized access and flow improvements across the system as a critical area of focus so Nova Scotians will have that improved access to care. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And Ms. Hamilton, my apologies. I did not scroll down far enough in my list of, of speakers here, and I missed that you have opening remarks as well. So, Ms. Hamilton. Good morning and uh, greetings from the paramedics. Um, I think right now we're at a uh, critical crossroads with the paramedics. Um, we've been talking for years about all these fixes, but I think at the end of the day, uh, our top priority right now needs to be on retention. Um, if you don't have paramedics on the ground, uh, I'm not sure what it is uh, that, that the contingency plan is gonna be. Um, well, we really need EM EMC and EHS to actually acknowledge that there's a problem. Um, I've never seen my coworkers at the state that they are right now. Um, and there's, there's an absolute disconnect um, between our management and uh, the paramedics. And we, we need to collaborate together and, and come up with some solutions. And I'm looking forward to working with everybody. Thank you very much, Ms. Hamilton. So we'll now open the floor for questions. We'll start the first round of questions with the Liberal Caucus, then we'll move on to the NDP and PC caucuses, each for 20 minutes. And just so people know, and when we reach, reach the 20 minute mark, I will, uh, I'll have to interrupt and cut off questions. I'd just like to give people a heads up. I'm not being rude. It's just the 20 minutes is up. Uh, so we will now uh, begin the, um, the questioning with Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of uh, paramedics for the hard work they do. I have some close friends that are paramedics, and um, you know, I understand the stress they they are under. Um, and unlike many jobs, um, when they go home, uh, it's not it's very difficult to turn the switch off. A lot of what they see and experience, they take home with them. Um, I have one of my close friends talks about um, a lot of his calls. Uh, he needs the police with him because of, uh, he, you know, he and he's he's not a small guy. 
but for his own safety, uh, you don't, he, you know, he would tell me, we don't know what we're walking into. Uh, we don't know the state of people's minds when we're walking into their house. Um, and the other thing he kind of, he told me, uh, which I, I really never thought about was pets. You know, he said, when you're walking into a house, um, and they have dogs, uh, you don't know, um, how those dogs are going to react to their owners being in, in an emergency situation and you putting their hands on them. So, um, a big, big thank you. Um, I do want to talk to Mr. Nickerson about the, um, I'll, I'll be the first to admit the well-deserved raise for the CCAs. Um, the, I personalize a lot of stuff. My mom who passed away, my foster mom who passed away a long time ago was, was a CCA and she'd come home with bad knees and a bad back. And it was just a very difficult job. Um, and I publicly said, I, I applaud the, uh, Houston government for, for the raise. Um, we know that, um, uh, you know, the work that paramedics do are at the utmost importance. You're on the front line <clears throat> when people are at their, their worst, uh, usually the first people that they see as a paramedic. Has there been, um, any discussion with the union about, um, I would argue a, a, a much deserved and listen, I was in government for eight years. <laughs> um, so I'll say this, a much deserved raise. I think that, uh, that raise, uh, that we saw with our, our paramedics, um, I think it should be on the table for, or sorry, with our, uh, CCA should be on, should be up for discussion with our paramedics. So, uh, is there, has there been any discussion with the government about the 25% increase for our paramedics? And Mr. McGuire, that was for Mr. Nickerson, correct? Or whoever wants to take it. I'm just looking at him. I apologize. And I was looking at Ms. Hamilton. So whoever wants wants to take that question, or Ms. Mr. McMullen? Mr. McMullen. Thank you. I appreciate your remarks about the paramedics. And yes, our paramedics are going through a terrible time in that. And uh, yes, it's very dangerous out there today. Uh, the the COVID virus has put a lot of people on edge. Uh, our patients that we go to see now are on edge sometimes. Mental health issues have skyrocketed. Uh, we're dealing much more with those issues in partnership with policing forces. And we definitely appreciate the police forces and their uh, coming to our aid and protecting our paramedics when they're out there in the field. And yes, we, we have discussed uh, with the Department of Health and with the employer the need to increase the amount of remuneration for paramedics. As my colleague, uh, Samantha, alluded to, retention is a big issue. Recruitment, yes, that's a big issue also. But how can you recruit if you can't retrain, retain your people? We're losing people to NSHA all the time because... They go there and they get paid well, and uh, they turn around and get uh, off on time. They get their meal breaks. You know, they're paid for their education, et cetera, et cetera. People are going out west. They're going to other services because the money is better there. So we're losing people. So in order to recruit, we really have to retain people. And that means we have to turn around and bring up. We've, we've brought up the scope of practice since I've been involved as a paramedic to where it is today is tremendous. We have the highly trained paramedics in this province that bring the ER right to your home. We bring it there. They're highly skilled, highly trained. They have great capabilities these days, but yet, although we're the top trained across Canada, we're one of the lowest paid services in Canada. So someone has to step up to the plate there and start saying, hey, and in order to keep people, we have to pay them appropriately. So thank you for Mr. your comments. Mr. McGuire. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for your comments. Yeah, just, I mean, just a quick Google search will show that paramedics uh, in Nova Scotia are 15 to $20 less an hour than other jurisdictions with, which $20 an hour is uh, for a lot of different professions is a good pay. So, um, you know, that's, that's a considerable difference. And, and um, so I'm hoping that, um, 
you know, that, that, that discussion happens, um, that you, you do see that, uh, increase and then you go into contract negotiations, obviously, um, to, um, I, I wanted to ask, um, and we could throw this out to the department of health or to the paramedics union, um, <clears throat> the impact of the Omicron virus has had, uh, this wave of the Omicron of, of COVID has had on the service delivery. And maybe Mr. Beaton or, or uh, Ms. Jensen or Ms. Sullivan can tackle this one. Um, because it seems as if the, um, the current government has, um, you know, there hasn't been that kind of urgency around Omicron that we've seen in the past. Uh, we know that uh, in January, for example, uh, Nova Scotia sadly has seen there was 35 people that passed away from Omicron. Um, we saw record numbers of hospitalizations and deaths since the beginning of Omicron. And yet um, very little information being trickled out to the public, very little like toned down uh, and um, uh, meetings and, and information sessions with the public. Um, I just want to know, since you're on uh, the front line and your members are on the front line, what kind of impact Omicron has had, actually had on our healthcare system? So maybe I'll throw that at Mr. Beaton. Mr. Beaton? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. Um, there's no doubt that uh, each wave of the pandemic has has created various challenges within the, uh, within the entire health workforce. Um, specifically with wave four, I think the biggest challenge that we've seen with, um, with Omicron um, has been the uh, the impact of close contacts as well as um, healthcare workers themselves contracting the virus and therefore leading to higher numbers of staff needing to be off, which only exacerbates um, the issues that we currently face from a staffing perspective. But um, if I may, I think uh, Charbel might be able to also add in um, into this one. So uh, I would like to maybe pass it to Charbel for some additional comments. Mr. Daniel. Sorry. Um, thank you. So I, I would echo the comments that uh, Craig has made uh, with the impacts that this has had on our workforce. Uh, Omicron, uh, this variant of COVID has truly been relentless. And uh, we've seen on average anywhere from 40 to 50 of our team members either exposed or have tested positive in our workforce at any given time with people coming back and, and others going off. Um, it's, it's definitely added further strain uh, to the system and, uh, and, and to the service delivery. Um, uh, it's, it's now starting to trend downwards, which we're happy to see. And our numbers of people that we see exposed or testing positive are, are down into the 30s and 20s. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to that completely going away. And uh, Mr. Mr. McGuire, I think, did you want someone from IUOE? Nope. To that's, okay. that's fine. I've got a few more questions. Oh, Mr. McMullen is, wants to go. Yeah. Mr. McMullen. Yes, Kelly, I'd like to address that issue too. We're, we're finding it's impacting our service delivery as paramedics because uh, we sometimes have up to 70 members have been off with uh, COVID due to this new wave. And unfortunately, in the past two years, now paramedics are being more cautious. At one time, I used to be able to go to work if I had a cold, what the heck, you know. Now with... COVID, everybody's concerned, so they're taking sick days. What's happened, we found, is now they're out of sick time. So now they're off work, but no sick days. So they have to wait two or three days before they can go on short-term disability. And, you know, that's causing a hardship for them financially. It's causing a hardship for them mentally, you know, and on an already strained workforce, it's making it bad, you know. Um, actually, Saturday night, I ended up working because our workforce was decimated in Cape Breton. Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. McMullen, and thank you for stepping up Saturday night. It's probably the last thing you wanted to do, but uh, thank you for doing that. Um, so my question is to, to Mr. Beaton um, 
or, or somebody from uh, Department of Health. Um, July 14th, uh, the previous government announced a program to improve patient flow, uh, which had $3 million budgeted. Um, and that was the uh, uh, tra uh, patient transfer. Um, and we heard earlier that um, that it has had, um, I think Ms., maybe Ms. Sullivan said that, or Ms. Jansen, um, that there was uh, there has been a positive impact uh, from that patient transfer system. It was a pilot program, one that was meant to go province-wide. So my question to you is, where is this program at uh, in regards to transferring transferring from a uh, pilot project to a province-wide, uh, and what's the holdup? So, Mr. McGuire, I heard three names there. Um, um, we had uh, Ms. Jensen. That was, it was for Mr. Beaton. Mr. Beaton? Okay. Mr. Beaton, please. Thank you very much. And, and just to clarify, um, I think what you're referring to is potentially the offload teams that we've instituted. Uh, okay. Um, so the, uh, there was an initiative to put in uh, an offload team specifically at the, uh, at the Halifax Infirmary. Um, and that was predicated on a model that was uh, showed some success at the Dartmouth General previously around uh, you know, helping us, helping offload times quick, which is establishing you know, a, a set unit of paramedic and a nurse. Happy to report that um, that that unit has been stood up. I think I would like to ask, ask Vicky from an operations perspective to maybe speak to the details uh, in terms of how that rolled out over the last number of months. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Kelly. Um, yes, um, the we did get approval here from Brendan for a pilot, um, and it involves two transition teams. It's actually a transition team to actually help offload the ambulances and a transition team to help offload into the inpatient area, which is slightly different than the other um, the other programs that have been set up. We were we have been um, challenged to actually get that fully staffed. Um, I think coming out of wave three, um, we did have some significant turnover and vacancies within the emergency department at the Halifax Infirmary. Um, it began um, with um, paramedic um, at the beginning of August, and it has gradually rolled out throughout the fall, and it is fully staffed as of January with an RN um, paramedic model. Um, and it was the period where we've seen the reduction is from September until the end of December. Um, again, when with the staff absences we've had dire directly related to Omicron um, during that later December into January, um, we have seen a reduction because obviously from the emergency department, they have to prioritize um, their staffing um, in, in their area. So there were some shifts obviously that we were not able to fully staff um, and keep everything operational. So that's where we are and uh, our staffing numbers, we are starting to see our numbers um, start to come back to work, which is really positive news, um, which in all of our areas will allow us to come um, gradually transition um, from where we are in terms of um, the focus on COVID and dealing with um, the patients are coming in to be able to transition and phase into um, some more regular operations. But it has had a significant impact, um, as indicated by Charbel as well, as we have seen um, across the health system, EHS, our staff in the inpatient areas, we've had a number of people out of the um, out of the workforce over this period of time, requiring us to de redeploy um, staff throughout the health system to keep vital um, vital services operational. Mr. McGuire. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, so the the Houston government campaigned on healthcare, obviously, and, and as Mr. McMullen uh, stated earlier, uh, one of the uh, things we know is is that uh, while uh, money is needed. Uh, 
for the healthcare system, uh, a big, big part of it is bodies and getting people uh, and recruiting people and having them stay. Um, it was, it's clear from the union standpoint, what is needed for retention. Um, and that's greatly appreciated for the, uh, that you gave us that answer. But uh, we also have to encourage uh, people to join the profession. So my question to Mr. McMullen would be how many people, how many uh, bodies are you going to need like, do you, would you need to recruit to add to your workforce to feel comfortable? And I know that's a that's a it's a it's a simple simplistic question. But right now, if you had a magic wand and you said we need X amount of new uh, paramedics on the street, how many would that be, Mr. McMullen? Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Magic wand. It, it, it's a pretty tricky question. Uh, right now, we have 21% of our workforce is uh, out on leave of absence, short-term disability, uh, workman's compensation, long-term disability. So if I was to take a magic wand, I would love to have something like 250 more paramedics at the minimum into the system to help us. Mr. McGuire. So that is a big number. Um, and that's not a one graduating class, obviously. Um, how do we get that number? How, uh, you know, it's one of the, like I said, the, the government campaigned on health care. I think one of the things that they're really going to run into is just uh, boots on the ground everywhere. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy to put 5,000 new CCAs and LPNs in the system because um, uh, we don't know where they're going to come from, honestly. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, um, and 250, I'm guessing that you could probably add an extra 100 onto that and you'd be pretty happy. Um, so how do we encourage um, individuals to join the profession, first of all? Second of all, um, is there a tuition forgiveness program for paramedics? Mr. McMullen? No, well, Mr. Deaton wants to say something too. Okay, we'll start with Mr. McMullen and then we'll move on to Mr. Deaton. Okay, uh, no, there's no uh, forgiveness on loans for paramedics at the present time, uh, other than uh, if you want to take uh, some training to become an advanced paramedic after your initial becoming a primary paramedic, you can apply to EMC and EMC will grant you uh, funding for your education. And you have to sign an agreement that you're willing to work for a specified period of time for EMC in order to work off that, uh, that monies that they're able in, to give. And, and I commend them for that. That's excellent in that. And and boots on the ground. Yes, Brendan, we're trying to get boots on the ground and uh, in collaboration with Department of Health and Wellness and uh, the College of Paramedics of Nova Scotia and their council. Uh, we've introduced a, a graduated licensing program, a temporary licensure for new graduates while they're waiting to get their copper exam written uh, to become fully qualified. Uh, that's a great step forward that will get us some boots on the ground, yes. Uh, but the key part of this is we have an exhausted workforce right now and it's decimated. If we can get that exhausted workforce uh, more time off, you know, they're getting denied vacations. I just got emails last night from people getting denied vacations. This is February and their vacations are denied. So they can't get time off to rest. Uh, so they need remuneration. They got to be brought up to the national standards. They, they've got to be paid more. They've got to get some meal breaks. They're working 12 hour days in a truck. And it's difficult to even get a break to have lunch. So Mr. we need to change the working conditions and we will be able to, it's a long-term game, you know, we're not talking tomorrow, we're gonna to fix this issue. We're talking long-term, but we will not recruit people to come from other jurisdictions if the wages are a lot higher up there than they are down here. Mr. Beaton? Yeah, thanks very much, uh, a great question. Um, I think it's important to, to note out that 
you know, prior to the pandemic, um, we were recruiting on average around, you know, almost 100, 100, I think in 2020, in 2019, where there was about 190 paramedics that were hired uh, into EMCI, that dramatically dipped as a result of the ability to provide in-class training uh, throughout the pandemic. Those numbers decreased to a low of, I think, less than 50 in 2020, slowly increasing back up. I think last year it was around 85 numbers in terms of recruitment. So we haven't quite got back to where we were from a recruiting perspective. We know that that is a significant challenge. Um, my understanding, and, and Charvel can probably clarify this, but I believe that 80 paramedics were just recently hired in January. As, as Kevin had outlined, um, you know, one of the initiatives that both the IUOE and, and the, uh, the employer EMC brought to us uh, was that graduated license as, as an opportunity to provide some immediate impact um, and get some boots on the ground, as, as you've indicated. You know, happy to also report that we are, um, have stood up a paramedic working group, which includes the members here, the IOOE, ourselves, EMCI, NSH, to look at these issues around recruitment and attention and uh, retention. And central to that is is our new Office of Healthcare Professional Recruitment. They're also involved in this and looking at a number of strategies that we can, can look at, uh, whether that's compensation, whether that's loan forgiveness, a number of pieces. Um, so, you know, back to the, the earlier comments, I think we have the right people um, around the table to bring forward solutions and we're, we're dedicated and committed to doing that. So I don't know if Charbel wanted to add any more to that, but um, thanks for the question. And we are done with the Liberal questioning now. We will now move on to the NDP caucus. Uh, Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us this morning. Uh, I also want to express um, gratitude and acknowledgement of the extremely difficult work that paramedics are doing, have done forever, but are doing uh, today even as we have this meeting. Um, but I also want to say that, you know, gratitude is just simply not enough. <laughs> um, you know, it's great. And acknowledgement is important, um, but we need real action. And I want to reiterate um, a couple of the comments that were made earlier that, you know, we were having this conversation three years ago at Health Committee. I was there with my colleague at the time, Tammy Martin, uh, who was the then MLA for Cape Breton Center. And we were having this conversation well before the pandemic. And I just want to read into the record a little exchange between Tammy Martin and Terry Chapman from the union at that time. Um, and Tammy asked him, how long typically does it uh, take to get an ambulance? And he said, that depends on the day, you know, and I won't read everything that everyone said, that depends on the day. But in 1997, uh, there was a requirement uh, in a township uh, for a, a response time of eight minutes and 59 seconds from the time you pick up the phone to the time that there's a paramedic at your door. And at that time, three years ago, Terry said he could now... Uh, now that uh, now that could be, we have actually seen one case uh, that I witnessed in the city that was 58 minutes. And Tammy said, is that acceptable? And Terry said to me, it's not. And Tammy said, uh, being from Cape Breton, I know many instances where there have been zero ambulances in CBRM. I also know that sometimes the nearest ambulances in Bedeck or Anaganish. If that was my family member who needed an ambulance, let me tell you, you would hear me screaming from the rooftops. What happens when I call an ambulance, God forbid, in New Waterford and the, and the nearest ambulance is in Bedeck? And Terry said, you wait. And Tammy said, my loved one just had a cardiac arrest. And Terry said, you wait with a person who will probably be non-living when they arrive. And that exchange was felt quite shocking at the time. And we know that that, that exact scenario is still happening three years later in Nova Scotia. It happened in my community of Dartmouth North this past year. It happened in uh, Halifax, Shibakto uh, earlier, and we will maybe hear a, a bit about those stories um, later on. So I guess my point in reading all of this is that it is I can't, I can't believe that we are talking about having, you know, we're standing this up and we're doing this. And I understand health systems are complex, but this is, this is, this is, it's, it's too much and it's, and it's, it's too late. <laughs> we have a broken system. And so the, what I want to say now, I want to, I want to hear from um, Ms. Hamilton actually, because this morning <clears throat> we received a letter uh, from a paramedic that describes a terrible uh, degree of burnout, uh, as we've heard already today, uh, and also of silencing of um, 
of paramedics uh, when they speak out about the issues that they're facing. And so the first thing I'd love to to hear uh, is, uh, you know, as difficult as it may be, Ms. Hamilton, I would love for you to tell us right now what it is like to be a paramedic on the ground in Nova Scotia and what changes uh, from your mouth do you think we need to better support paramedics and address the burnout that you're experiencing? Ms. Hamilton? Thank you for the question. And uh, yeah, I have never seen it like this before. Um, the burnout is just beyond every day. If you went and talked to uh, a lot of my colleagues um, and it, fit for duty, there'd be a lot of people that are on the trucks right now that really shouldn't even be there, but it, there's nobody else that will be there. And they all know that. Um, we all know what the system is like. Um, I, I myself, I've responded from Kenfield to Weymouth, which is, you, you heard it in the letter, it's an hour and a half uh, for respiratory distress. Uh, you know, I didn't sign up for that. You know, we didn't sign up for somebody to be in respiratory distress and not know what's going to happen for an hour and a half and get there. And, you know, they're tired. They can't breathe anymore. And, you know, we can do a lot of things. We have a lot of treatments, but everything is time-based and we have all these wonderful things that we can do. Uh, we have clot busting drugs, but you know, right. For me to get somebody to the cath lab in the city, it has to be in under an hour. A lot of times we don't even get there in under an hour. And, you know, uh, we're getting sent all over the province now. And we go from one call to the next call to the next call. And there's just no time to do anything. No time for meals. No time for bathroom breaks. And, you know, it's... It's devastating to see all of my colleagues and what they're going through, and nobody wants to listen. Ms. LeBlanc? Ms. LeBlanc? Sorry about that. I, <laughs> I lost my screen. Um, thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Uh, um, so we know that there's a lot to unpack in the whole system system issue. Um, we know that there are root problems that are facing paramedics. We've heard about the about the remuneration issue, which obviously makes a lot of sense. We also know that emergency rooms are overcrowded or closed, uh, which means the offload times are, are uh, challenging. Um, we know that hospitals are uh, operating above capacity uh, in many cases, uh, and that there are not enough long-term care beds for folks who are, are waiting for, for uh, placement in long-term care who are in the hospital. And we know that doctors and nurses and paramedics and, and, and all of the clinicians on the ground are burning out. So um, I guess I'll ask uh, someone from the union, you can choose who wants to answer. Um, in terms of the whole, the system in general, what would you say are the changes needed to better support paramedics? Any takers from the union? Mr. McMullen, I'll go to you first. Okay. And that the system, you know, is in failure. It's in failure because, uh, Unfortunately, in the past few years, uh, as you alluded to, and three years ago, we had the same problems, and they're not corrected three years later. Well, this goes back even further than three years. You know, um, this system was taken over by EMC. It was brought up to a higher standard. However, uh, we're now at the stage where a number of employees that were hired at that time are retiring and unfortunately they're retiring rapidly and not as slowly as we would like to see because they're now in a, in a position where they're getting burnt out and they're retiring. So we have that gap there. We're losing uh, highly trained, highly experienced paramedics to retirement. 
and ones behind them that come on scene are now leaving for other jurisdictions because they want to go to somewhere where the work stress is a little, little less for them. And we haven't done a recruitment fast enough to replace these people. And as Craig alluded to, yes, we tried doing this with Ontario. We brought people in from Ontario and we were successful at only keeping a certain amount of those paramedics because they came down here, they wanted to go back home. They needed to come down to get the experience in order to work on an ambulance system up there other than a transfer service. And, you know, uh, you can't blame them for that. But it's hard to retain employees, like I say, without the proper wage for the employees and proper working conditions in that. It, you know, it's a system that's in failure. And yes, Craig is alluded to rightly so, that we have to cooperate together as a union, our ground paramedics, EMC, Department of Health and Wellness, everybody to work on this. But, you know, we have to have some immediate fixes now. We need them now more than later. You know, the planning stages are great. Yes, that's, that's a big improvement, but we need some action now. Ms. LeBlanc? Thank you. Oh, uh, Ms. Hamilton has her hand up too, Madam yeah. Chair. Ms. Hamilton? Thank you. Um, I think we just need to acknowledge that there's a problem. We need to fix it right now. Um, we need to get our meals. We need to be off on time. Uh, in New Brunswick, they're putting them off. Uh, they have a new mandate where at the end of their shift, they're out of service. We need the same thing. We can't be going to 16 hours. Uh, like right now, I'm a 24 year medic and to get to 12 hours, it is killing me. It's just too much. And if you're in cardiac arrest and I'm supposed to be at my prime thinking right then uh, on my 13th hour, my 14th hour, and I'm supposed to make all these decisions about your care, you want me at my prime, not absolutely exhausted. And we, we need to do something like that. We need to start prioritizing the calls. We, we go to low acuity calls all the time. And the dispatch system that we're using is from 20 years ago. Um, I used to work at dispatch. Um, I, I don't think there's been many changes. And it, it's sending ambulances to things that need to be they can be put on hold. We, we have a, a system that's a CTAS system that we use. Um, it's from one to five. Um, and fours and fives, when we bring them into the hospital, they will go right to the chairs. So we need to start prioritizing those calls. It, very rarely do we go to a low acuity call that ends up being a CTASC one. The st statistics are very low. And you know, responding from Kentville to the city for a call. And I've been put on three, four calls that I never, ever get to. And, and a lot of them are low acuity calls. Why am I doing that? Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't even make sense. Ms. LeBlanc? Thanks. Well, I guess that, that sort of segues into my next question, which is about the code critical situation. So, um, you know, uh, the union has done a great job about, of, of sort of, um, uh, whatever the word is, advertising, uh, when there is a code critical uh, on social media, uh, getting that information out. Um, um, it's common for the for, for me to get like many many notifications, dozens of code critical no notifications um, from around the province uh, in in a week, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what is entailed in a code critical, quote, like quote unquote code critical, and what are the crit criteria, and what does it mean for paramedics when there's a code critical, and what does it mean for people waiting for an ambulance. Um, Mr. McMullen? <laughs> Mr. McMullen. Am I getting picked on here? <laughs> Thanks for the question, and you're correct. Uh, code critical is a situation where we have 
two or less ambulances available in a county. And just to tie into that, I can give you some statistics. This is just from January 1st to present. We have had 247 code criticals. That's a lot. Okay. So we're running short all the time in that. The cold criticals, all the province, five, all the mainland were five. Western is a hard hit area, it's 88. Northern, 20. Central, seven. Cape Breton, 14 cold criticals. And that's just ones that are reported. Ms. LeBlanc? Yeah, thank you. When you read the numbers like that, it's quite stark, isn't it? Uh, um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's it's really troubling. Um, uh, I guess I, I just want to go back to the letter that we received quickly and uh, and ask, um, I guess, ask the uh, EMC, uh, or, yeah, EMC, <laughs> what is your acronym? Um, I'm wondering if the department or EMC can, can commit uh, to the sort of questions in that letter that, that are asking for um, a provision of statistics around half-staffed half staffed or empty ambulances, uh, hours of forced overtime, and um, the numbers of paramedics that are not able to access vacation time. Um, and then, yeah, so in many, in many parts of the healthcare system, we have reporting of statistics, um, wondering if EMC can commit to reporting those statistics on a sort of, I guess, monthly or weekly basis, maybe monthly to start. Um, what uh, wondering and what your reaction might that might be to that, Mr. Uh, Daniel. Mr. Daniel? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a couple of things I'd like to quickly address as well. Um, there's no denying this the strain on on the workforce right now and the and the challenging work environment that exists. The paramedic profession uh, is, is definitely a difficult profession, and what our our teams are exposed to are, are is uh, by no means a, a, an easy type of atmosphere. Um, making sure that people get their meal breaks and and ensuring that people get home on time um, has always been our number one priority, and and we are working diligently on on a shift end mitigation process. Uh, we, we do collaborate with our partners as well in other jurisdictions. Um, we know that New Brunswick, as uh, Ms. Hamilton alluded to, had uh, tried to do a shift and mitigation process where they were ensuring people were getting off at the end of their shift. Uh, however, that was unsuccessful. It, it only lasted for a few days and they had to retract that process because they, they, couldn't, they couldn't maintain it and they couldn't sustain that process. Um, we are working on the foundation to ensure that we can do that in a safe and efficient manner for both our staff and Nova Scotians. But going back to the question at the end, um, these statistics are things that we do track and, and we do collect and, and we do share them uh, with the Department of Health and Wellness. And so I would have to uh, um, pass this question off to uh, Craig to respond to. Um, Mr. Just to Mr. Beaton, thank you. There's a lot of witnesses today. <laughs> no, it's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, we do get we do collect a number of stats. We would have to look at what specific stats. I don't have the letter um, that you're referring to, uh, Ms. LeBlanc, so I would have to look at what those stats are and see what we could come up with. Um, I think one of the important things that, that I would outline is that we, with the new contract with the EMC, one of the things we are committed to um, is is increased, uh, in, increased transparency, and we will be producing a yearly uh, EHS report. Um, as a result of that. So um, perhaps those stats could be incorporated into that uh, report as well. Um, Mr. Nickerson and then Ms. Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to Mr. Daniel's point uh, about New Brunswick and their shift in mitigation uh, policy, uh, the other day when I spoke with my colleagues in New Brunswick, they actually informed me that that policy is actually still in place uh, today, just for the record. Uh, Ms. Jensen. Uh, thanks very much. We do uh, uh, a fair amount of reporting between EMC and DHS, DHW, uh, certainly in terms of all, all sorts of different aspects of uh, the organization and the operations for EHS operations. Uh, I'm sure that this is something that we could uh, collaborate on as well. Um, if permissible, uh, Ms. Chair, I wouldn't mind looping back around to the excellent point that Ms. Hamilton 
uh, brought up about the about low acuity calls. And if we could just return to that, the processes that we use within the uh, provincial EHS medical communication center and uh, some of the steps we're making moving forward in terms of um, uh, call management for lower acuity callers. Uh, as Ms. Hamilton mentioned and, and is experienced in, our uh, medical communication officers use a very structured, uh, it's an internationally accredited call screening process for all emergency calls uh, that come in through 911 and our medical calls that come through to our EHS medical um, communication center. Though the communication officer walks with the caller through a, a process to identify what's wrong with the patient and the acuity of that patient. Um, it, it, indeed, there are opportunities for alternative care pathways for low, lower acuity EHS patients. Um, right now, when we have longer response times, our advanced care paramedic who's in the comm center, along with our uh, medical communication center physician, will call those patients back and do a clinical check-in with them. Um, and we are implementing, we're moving forward with government support on implementing a nurse within the medical communication center. And that clinician's role, we're very much looking forward to it, is also to use a structured program. And for our lower acute EHS callers, uh, we'll be walking through to do additional clinical assessment with them and identify all- Order, the order. The time for the NDP questioning has elapsed. We'll now move on to the PC caucus, starting with Mr. Young. Mr. Young? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chair, and, and thank you to everyone who's, uh, who's joining us who appeared today. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to, um, we'd like to thank all the paramedics for the high quality care that they provide Nova Scotians each and every day and acknowledge their hard work and dedication. And uh, I know a lot of uh, paramedics in, um, in my county, and personally, I'd like to extend that and thank you sincerely for your service. As this is a backward looking committee, I'd like to talk about um, policies that were rolled out. So my first question is, um, what positive impacts on the system do you anticipate the announcement of a new temporary graduate license that will allow paramedic students to work in their field sooner? And could you see this also helping with recruitment and retention uh, to Mr. Beaton or Mr. McMullen? Mr. Beaton? Yeah, thank you very much. I can I can start. I'm happy to pass on it over to uh, to my colleagues as well. But um, I think as we talked about earlier, uh, the immediate impact will be to have those graduates who typically have to wait a few months before they can actually practice as they wait to write their proper exam. Uh, we can have them working side by side with a uh, with a license, a fully licensed paramedic. So there's obviously benefits to that of them getting firsthand training, but also increasing the workforce immediately once upon their on their graduation and, and really sort of getting them into uh, into the Nova Scotia experience. So um, maybe Charbel might also want to answer as well as uh, as well as Kevin. Mr. Daniel. Yes, thank you, Craig. Uh, so just to put in perspective the timelines and the impacts that this will have uh, previously graduates could wait up to three months after finishing their paramedic program to write the copper exam. And upon completing the copper exam, it's uh, usually about 12 weeks to receive the results of that exam, uh, upon which after both of those timelines have been met, they can apply for employment and, and go through the onboarding process. So we, we were seeing a delay of almost potentially up to six months after classes graduate before we can actually recruit those uh, individuals or those graduates. And with this new announcement, uh, and, and I've been working closely with the union and, and DHW and the college on this, uh, we're, we're excited on the implications on that ability to, to recruit sooner. Uh, any additions that, that we can do, anything we can do on the recruitment side uh, will, will help ease the strain on the entire workforce uh, that exists today. Mr. McMullen? Yes, uh, from the union perspective, yes, we were very pleased uh, to collaborate uh, with Craig in the Department of Health and Wellness and uh, with EMC and the college in regards to this because uh, it gives these people that are graduated from classes, as Charbel noted, a chance now to get right into the workforce and keep their skill level up before they could be anywhere from six months to nine months, some even a year before they get into the workforce. And then they're a little bit rusty, they're nervous, 
you know, they don't get a chance to get that experience that they're going to get now by getting a temporary license. It's a, a process that's been accepted in other jurisdictions as well as in the RN field here in Nova Scotia. So we're very happy to have that. It's definitely a help, but we definitely do need more help, that's for sure. Mr. Young? Thank you. I'll pass it to my colleague, Ms. Sheehy Richard. Ms. Sheehy Richard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do also want to, to say thank you to the hardworking paramedics across our great province. Uh, I, I feel my heart, and it's hard not to choke up as I speak to you today, um, and also uh, want to help and work on getting some solutions and immediate impact. So, um, Ms. Sullivan, I was going to go back to the offload times, and I kind of like to think of the healthcare system maybe like the chains of a bicycle, um, where the, they all kind of connect together. With the recent announcement for the construction projects for more long-term care beds uh, across the province, as well as the higher pay for the CCAs, um, could you speak about how developing the capacity for care outside of Nova Scotia, or care for Nova Scotians outside of the acute care system, and how that would benefit our emergency services? And do you expect that as we get these acute care beds um, operating again in our long-term care, do you expect that that should have a good impact or uh, on our improve our offload times? Ms. Sullivan? Uh, yeah, um, thank you. And uh, a, a great question. And uh, you're right from an acute care perspective right now, we do have um, over 400 um, clients across Nova Scotia health facilities who are waiting for long-term care. Um, we have been working with our Department of Seniors and long-term care colleagues, and you're absolutely right. Um, the initiatives that the government has recently announced um, with um, some of the recruitment strategies, increased wages for continuing care, working with our long-term care colleagues to actually be able to open that closed capacity, um, will make a big difference in terms of being able to most appropriately move those individuals to where they're where they get the care they deserve. Um, and um, the additional capacity will also help um, meet some of the growing demands. In addition to that, we have um, through EHS, some of the special programs and others, programs that EHS offers, we are able to focus on trying to keep certain individuals out of the hospital. And for many, that is a much better um, plan to be cared for at home. For example, somebody requiring palliative care or supporting people to go home with Home First. And there have been some um, augmentations through Home First around some additional funding to support families to look after their loved ones at home, which is facilitating some discharges home. So we do expect as the long-term care sector opens up that we will free up the acute care capacity, which will help overall flow from a system perspective. I think what we know is that flow, either flow, keeping people in the community flow through the hospital or sending people home to the community. It's critically important that the whole system is working together and our partnership with EHS and long-term care um, and looking at initiatives will actually help um, help that is a critically important. Ms. Sheehy Richard. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan and Madam Chair. Um, as this is quite a, a topic for all of us and impacting all our, our communities, I, I want to give my colleague, uh, Mr. Ritzy, a, a chance to ask a question as well today. Mr. Ritzy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I too uh, would also like to thank all the paramedics and healthcare workers right across the province for all that you do to keep us safe and healthy. So thank you so much. Uh, my questions are directed to uh, Ms. Sullivan or Mr. Beaton. Uh, our government has expanded access to virtual care for Nova Scotians, waiting for a family doctor to ensure everyone has access to a form of primary care while recruitment efforts are enhanced. Are you able to quantify for us the number of lower acuity emergency department visits that could be seen in a primary care setting? And also, could you touch on the anticipated benefits of the virtual care pilot expansion will have on reducing the strain on emergency departments that are or at or above capacity in Nova Scotia. Thank you. Ms. Sullivan. 
thank you for the question. I don't have the specific data in terms of the um, number of emergency visits it will um, avert. What I can tell you from a virtual care Nova Scotia perspective, the pilot originally started from a need of family practice in um, Northern and Western. Um, and it has um, now in mid December um, rolled out to Eastern as well as Central. So it is now rolled out. Invitations were issued, I know, from a central zone and eastern zone um, in the be in the middle of um, December. There has been good uptake. They did focus those invitations on the um, areas in specific zones where the largest number of people were on the need of family practice registry. So for example, in the central zone, it would have been in the Shibokto area. Um, those invitations have gone out. We have gotten good uptake in terms of people who do need to be seen, and a certain number of those patients are um, requiring in-person visits. We do see and we know that a certain number of people were coming to emergencies because they weren't able to access um, their primary care they didn't have access to a primary care practitioner. So that is one avenue. The other pilot that is going to be taking place in February that is supported as well through government is looking at a virtual pilot that will happen in Northern Zone in the um, Truro Hospital. And that is um, for people coming in that are of a lower um, acuity level, they will be offered the opportunity to have a virtual visit. Um, and we do see that those um, that those that will help with the wait times for those people, but also um, free up some space um, there. So that is coming up, I believe in the middle of February is when that is scheduled. Um, and based on that proof of concept, um, there is, um, we hope to be able to expand that out further. So there is lots of initiatives looking at how, how we can improve access to primary care that could potentially move people out of emergency departments to um, more settings of care. Uh, Mr. Beaton, did you want to add anything to that? I think uh, Vicky covered most of it with, um, with, with the virtual care. I guess the one thing that I would add is, you know, um, about one third of all emergency calls are actually treated by paramedics. So that actually prevents them from showing up to the ED. Many of those would have been fours and fives. So I think that's a real uh, benefit of our system. Like as Kevin and others have talked about the scope of practice with these highly trained professionals, the ability to sort of treat and release and prevent them from showing up um, is something that we continually look at to try and prevent them from actually coming. And, and I believe the stat is, and Dr. Travers can probably speak better to this uh, in terms of his clinical oversight, but, but I think uh, I think it's about only 5% of those actually that are treated uh, on site by those paramedics actually have an incidence of having to, having to show up for a, a follow up. So I think really good, really good stats to showcase, um, you know, the professionalism and, and the, the abilities of our paramedics. Dr. Travers. Thank you to the member for that question. Uh, uh, Mr. Bean is correct about it's an important metric for the committee to understand that one in three emergency 911 calls are not transported to the emergency department. And that is a, a number that's been there for years. It's been very stable at that. So not all 911 calls need to be an ambulance transport to the emergency department. An alternative pathway can be created and we're building those pathways in partnership with the health authority. But it's very important to understand that you need to make sure there's quality and safety for that patient. And so for those patients that are not transported to the eMERGE, when we follow up with them, only 5% of them relapse back to a 911 call. And I think that's a very good measure. It's a safe program and the safe measures that paramedics are doing. And of those that relapse back, that 5%, only one in eight of them are actually sick in terms of requiring a, a, a time sense of element to their care. Regardless of those cases, we always do deeper dives on those to make sure of lessons we can learn from it. But just again, to summarize, one in three 911 calls are not transported to the ED. And by proxy, that's an element of some virtual care for these patients. Thank you, Dr. Travers. Mr. Ritzy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you uh, uh, to the witnesses for answering my question. This again goes back to uh, Ms. Sullivan or Mr. Beaton. Could you talk to us a bit more about uh, telehealth and the 811 service 
particularly its impact in helping alleviate this capacity problem, if at all. Ms. Sullivan? Um, I would defer to um, uh, uh, Craig to speak to the 811. Um, I do know that from um, during the pandemic and throughout this period of time, we have offered the ability for um, virtual visits um, that have increased and supported people's access. Um, and that has primarily not only been in the primary health care, but I know that we've offered some wellness programming and other programs through virtual, um, as well as access to some specialists, um, appropriate visits that could be done um, virtually as opposed to in person. Um, I will defer to um, Craig to speak to the 811 piece. Mr. Beaton. Thanks very much. Um, uh, yes, 811 continues to be another uh, another toolkit that we have in terms of accessing and giving patients another, another opportunity to call in and use virtual care in a different way. It is a different process from what we've set up with virtual care NS, uh, but I think 811 over the years has proven to be, um, and we've had a great relationship with uh, with 811 and the ability to provide care to patients, particularly with it throughout the pandemic. Um, you know, the, the amount of changes that they've been able to do to be able to support um, not only, you know, notifications and information of the public around proof of vaccine, but also vaccine bookings, you know, they've stood up uh, a number of times for us. And, you know, we've had as high as 9,000 calls a day uh, through to, through to 811 uh, in, in the peak, um, and they've been able to handle that uh, very, very well. Okay, and back uh, to uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and again, thank you to the witnesses uh, for the answers. I'm going to pass it on to my uh, colleague, John McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I do want to thank the uh, paramedics and all the first responders. I'm fortunate in 10 years of volunteering. I've worked with a lot of paramedics, and yes, they definitely deserve what um, more than what they're getting. Um, to get a better understanding of the call volumes when regards to emergency transfers or actually all patient transfers. I'm wondering how many are we getting um, for this and will the new patient transfer process that's been rolled out, will that do any benefit? And I'm gonna guess, Madam Chair, that would be, I was thinking it was gonna be Mr. Uh, Daniel, but I seen Mrs. Jansen put her hand up. So I guess Mrs. Jansen, Madam Chair. Ms. Jensen. Thank you, uh, and and you you aren't wrong, Mr. McDonald. I will end up passing it over to to uh, my colleague Cher Bell to speak to this as well. Uh, EHS does uh, provide a critical function within the Nova Scotia health system in terms of uh, patient access and flow with with uh, EHS transfers. We're in the vicinity of 150 to 220 transfers per day. About 30% of our overall EHS call volume are transfers. So those are movements of patients to, from, and within the health system or between the different hospital sites. Um, in regards to your question about the impact of uh, increased transfer resources or medical trans transfer service and uh, increased number of uh, patient transfer units, one of our main goals with that was to ensure that transfers, more transfers are facilitated by those units rather than by emergency paramedic crews. In January of this year, about 62% of our transfers were managed by emergency paramedic crews, and that's now dropped to about 36% uh, or so. Uh, and how often we're on time at the time that the call, that the transfer is requested has increased from the low 70s up into, uh, up into around 82% or so, but we'll continue striving and working closely with Nova Scotia Health um, on patient access and flow, patient prioritization, coordination. Uh, certainly the command center that Ms. Sullivan spoke about earlier is going to help significantly with um, uh, coordination between Nova Scotia Health and EHS. And we are moving forward. We, we implemented a screening software system in our communication center in July to screen the, tr the transfer requests in a particular way to accurately identify their needs, the patient needs for those transfers and how urgently those transfers are needed. And we have approval to move forward with a system uh, to move from 
What right now is largely uh, transfer requests are phoned into the communication center. We're going to be moving towards an online system where any requester, family member, the patient, the, the hospital uh, clinician can book it online, receive live time updates to any changes to it, and more use of artificial intelligence to help increase efficiencies. So some, some things coming down the pike in terms of transfers that are going to be quite helpful. Um, Charbel, I'll pass it over to you if you have anything you'd like to add from an operational perspective. Mr. Daniel. Thank you. Um, so as, as Jan alluded to, there's been a lot of increased efficiencies on the patient transfer side of things. And I'd just like to speak briefly about how we were able to accomplish these. Um, as we spoke about earlier, there was the introduction of our medical transport service early in the early last year, which at the beginning of last year did not exist. Uh, we started with a pilot of three of those units and have since increased that to 10 of these units across the province. These units are able to transport between six to seven patients, uh, non-critical ambulatory patients that are spread out across all regions of the province. Uh, moreover, um, some of the stresses that we see in the system and the call volume that land on our emergency ambulances, uh, we've been trying to find a capacity to move some of the transfers off, as Jan had spoken to, and move that into our patient transfer services. So early, uh, late last year, we saw the expansion of patient transfer units, which had introduced a new role into that area called the transport operators, uh, which allowed us to increase the capacity of our patient transfer units by twofold, uh, 100%. Uh, this year, we're further expanding this service and looking at our multi-patient transfer services and using the same type of strategy to increase that capacity across the province as well. So we're looking forward to more efficiencies and, and also being able to remove more of that patient transfer capacity off of the emergency ambulances. Okay, and we uh, have, have about 30 seconds left. Uh, if you would like to wrap that up, Mr. McDonald. <laughs> um, I don't think I can say anything for less than 30 seconds, so thank you. All right, we'll now move on to our next round of questioning, which will be short. Uh, each, each caucus will get an additional three minutes. Uh, Mr. McGuire. I don't think I can say a full thing in three minutes. I'm just joking. Uh, I said, my, my, my question is to Mr. Beaton. Um, the, we, we've seen code criticals. Uh, we've seen the, the union um, do a very good job, the code criticals. We've, we've heard here today um, how uh, they are feeling and how their members are feeling. Um, I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect, and I'm not blaming one side or the other. I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect. Um, what, what, what is your opinion on the code criticals, and what is causing this disconnect between the employer and the employee? Mr. Beaton? Yeah, thanks very much. I think uh, in, in terms of the, the relationship with the employer, I think I would turn that over to, to Charbel. But, I, but, but to answer your question, you know, I, I do think that, as we said earlier, um, there's, been a, there's a lot of strain in the health system, as we know, and, and everybody, uh, including paramedics on the front lines, are, are tired. Um, they've been through quite a bit over the last two years, and uh, and we're asking more of them each and every day throughout this. But in terms of the the actual employee employer relationship, I know that EMC is dedicated to doing that. They have a number of uh, of new initiatives, including an employee uh, advisory group that they've just recently started. So maybe I could ask Charvel to speak to that, Mr. Daniel. Yes, thank you. So as uh, Mr. Beaton alluded to, there's uh, the formation of our employee advisory committee that uh, has started and, and will have the uh, input and, and co-lead of uh, Dr. Ron Stewart as well. Uh, our goal with that is to have representation from all of our frontline paramedics uh, to, to provide input into our operations, different areas that we can continue to improve and enhance and provide a pathway for, for direct input from our frontline teams. Uh, above and beyond that, we also do host uh, bi-monthly town hall sessions, and we have great turnouts at those 300-plus attendees from our uh, entire workforce. Uh, that uh, is an open venue for us to talk about the initiatives that we're working on, along with uh, a Q&A session to answer any questions. Um, and this is, of course, above and beyond regular communications, uh, the opportunity to directly uh, email any of us through different venues, uh, or simply just to, to reach out directly. Our, our doors are always open and, and we're heavily uh, focused and we're always listening to our feedback from our team. Mr. McGuire, very quickly. 
Uh, I just want to say thank you for everyone for, for being here today, uh, along with the paramedics, the dispatch operators, all of them. It's a very stressful job. Right next to my office was a, a paramedic uh, um, depot, uh, um, so I saw firsthand every day what they were going through. Also to the staff at Public Health. Order. Uh, and Order. Thank I was going to thank them too, so thank you. I thank know you're you, Mr. McGuire. Too. We'll move on to the NDP caucus. Uh, Ms. Chender. Uh, good morning, everyone. I know I only have a couple of minutes and I, of course, want to echo the thanks you've heard from everyone on the committee. Uh, but I do want to ask a specific question. I'd like to put it to both uh, the IOE and the department, but I think I'll stick to the IOE given the exigencies of time. Um, as an MLA on the media list for the Nova Scotia Health uh, I get notices of emergency room closures uh, more than any other single piece of email. Um, emergency rooms are closed all the time, and those closures have increased year over year for a decade almost. <laughs> it's not just uh, Omicron. And so I guess my question is, what is the specific impact of those closures on the issues that we're discussing today? And so I don't know who, but if someone from the IOE would like to uh, take that on. I'd, I'd love to hear what, what the experience of that on the ground is. Ms. Hamilton? Sorry. My experience with it is, is I actually work at a Middleton and um, Middleton is closed and been closed for a long time. So it just increases our time for our calls. Uh, a lot of the time when Middleton is closed, Digby is closed as well. And that it just expands our area to just a huge area. We normally have to go to Valley Regional then or to Yarmouth Regional, which is quite a distance. So now your call time that you're in the back of the truck with people is a lot longer. Your treatment time is a lot longer. And um, then that's less ambulances for people in that area. Uh, and that's what's making, um, there's a, a lot more code criticals now. Um, and it, it's just, it's beyond the point of, um, being a code critical because I, I go into work and it's a code critical when I start mm -hmm. um, on my shift. So it's, you know, every day is a code critical now in my area. So, um, but that's my, my exposure with the, the closures. It's really impacting um, our work. Ms. Chender? Well, with the remaining moments, maybe uh, NSH could comment briefly on what's contributing um, to you know the ongoing closures of emergency departments across this province, particularly in rural Nova Scotia, as we just heard. Do you want uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority? So, Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Sullivan. Uh yeah, thank you, um, Claudia. The, uh, the emergency room closures are um, directly related to um, staff and physician um, availability in terms of being able to um, keep them open. Um, I think it's um, from an overall perspective that has been an ongoing challenge. Um, in our small rural sites, the emergency rooms are staffed by um, family physicians or primary care order, practitioners. Order, with order. The time for the NDP questioning has elapsed. We'll now go to the PC caucus. Mr. Boudreaux. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and just like the rest of my colleagues, certainly on this um, this committee meeting, I want to extend my gratitude and thanks to the medics and emergency staff that um, play a role uh, in my riding in Richmond, but all in Nova Scotia. Um, not only are paramedics, uh, you know, leaders in emergency care, but they're also a huge volunteer base and support in our communities. I can tell you that uh, a lot of my friends are paramedics who go above and beyond, not just in their in their profession, but um, in volunteering their time in our community. So I want to extend that thanks. But I do have one, uh, one question that I'd like to ask, um, and maybe I'll put it towards um, Mr. McMullen and Mr. Beaton and, uh, and anybody else who wants to answer is, uh, yesterday, our government announced an important safety upgrade uh, with an additional $30.5 million in funding for new power structures and loaders in ambulances. Can, can you ex uh, expand on the details of this announcement, maybe, Mr. Beaton, and how it will benefit um, paramedics and, and the system more broadly as well? Mr. Beaton? Sure, thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, yesterday we were pleased. That was one of the recommendations that was outlined the Fitch report from injury prevention. We know that um, uh, 
a large number of injuries that paramedics are facing are musculoskeletal. Um, this is an opportunity to make sure that they have the right equipment in those vehicles to be able to alleviate some of that. So, you know, happy to report that all of the vehicles previously have, but this new announcement will now make sure that they're outfitted uh, power loaders and power stretchers in all of our ambulance units, which is not only helpful for um, for paramedic injury prevention, but also for patient safety as well, um, in, in terms of enabling those lists. And the time for the PC caucus has now elapsed. Um, if anyone has a closing statement, we can go to those now. Um, Mr. Beaton, do you have one? Uh, no closing statement. Just want to thank uh, thank the witnesses and the members here for the opportunity to speak to this uh, to speak to this. Thing. So I uh, appreciate everybody's time. Okay, and Dr. Travers, do you have anything you wanted to add there? Uh, folks, it's just uh, February is heart month. And I think it's an important thing to recognize that despite all the concerns that communities may have about uh, ED closures and uh, delayed response times, we have had a lot of successes. Uh, everything we do as physicians, nurses, the emergency department, departments and ambulances for cardiac arrest, for example, is uh, paled by what a bystander can do if they have access to an AED. And I think we should be proud. We've got 1,586 AEDs registered in the province. We have four 24-hour public safe stations, and those are growing. We anticipate there's going to be more AEDs in communities. And it's exciting that every Nova Scotia that calls 911, that our teams are able to provide the direction towards AEDs, as well as providing CPR instructions. And I think it's uh, we have challenges before us, but I'm, I'm excited to make uh, Nova Scotia even more of a heart-safe communities across the province. Thank you, Dr. Travers. Uh, Mr. Daniel, do you have a closing statement? Uh, I'd just like to thank the committee members for uh, having us here today. And uh, also wanna recognize and, and continue to thank our, our frontline team members for all of their hard work and, and contribution and sacrifices that they make on a daily basis, uh, especially during this pandemic uh, where they were very quick to put their capes on and step up as the healthcare heroes we so desperately needed. So thank you. Ms. Jensen? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so on behalf of myself and Charbel and all of EMC, EHS Operations Management, uh, we do want to thank you as the chair and the members for inviting us here today to, to have this discussion. Uh, certainly the opportunity to discuss the challenges that are facing the EHS and the greater healthcare system uh, right now, uh, but even more importantly, the, the focus on improvements um, as we advance our system into the future to meet the needs of Nova Scotians. Also just want to take a moment to say to um, uh, the HS uh, paramedics, comm officers, nurses, physicians, and our, all of our teams, we, uh, we do hear you, we're listening to you, uh, and we want to thank you. Uh, you have worked tireless, tirelessly uh, to provide quality care and services and to be there when Nova Scotians need you. So I'd like to thank you as well. Um, and thank you very much again for the invitation to be here today. Thank you. Over to Mr. McMullen. Thank you very much uh, for inviting us as the union representing paramedics in Nova Scotia to have this conversation. I think it's an important one and uh, we need more collaboration with Department of Health and Wellness with EMC and uh, CPNS and we're doing so. And there are positive things, but also we cannot forget that in that time frame I gave you from January to now, there was 255 missed lunches you know, there's uh, 200 and uh, 200 and no, 182 shift overruns. So that's people that are not getting home to see their children, you know, to say goodnight to them. That's time lost that's never coming back. You know, we need help out there now. We do. Our paramedics, I can't thank them enough for all they're doing every day, every shift. I can't thank them enough, but we need to step up to the plate and help them now. We're helping them with some collaborative initiatives now with new power load stretchers. That's great. The fact that we've got, you know, a graduated license system, a temporary license, that's great. But we really do need help for our paramedics out there. They're virtually hanging on by their fingertips. Thank you for thank your time. Thank you, Mr. McMullen. Mr. Nichols Nickerson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
I don't really have any closing remarks other than uh, as legislators, um, please heed our warnings uh, that we've we've mentioned today. Uh, I would like to uh, recognize Mr. McDonald. Uh, totally agree with you. Paramedics need to be paid more. Absolutely. <coughs> Um, they're doing their best every day, uh, day in, day out, day in, day, day out. Uh, but uh, they are struggling, as Miss Hamilton alluded to and, and Mr. McMullen earlier. Uh, I don't think any of us are naive enough to uh, to think that there's not problems out there. When paramedics have to call in sick after their shift just so they can go back to their home base, there's major problems and issues within the system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I, I really hope that you will take some time and really go over the letters that were sent in. We desperately need your help. Um, all my colleagues, everybody has an exit strategy right now. And we're just, if there's no paramedics, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And we're beyond code critical. We're at code disaster. And uh, you just, I, I'm willing to work with anybody and I'm willing to work with our leadership to change the culture. And uh, if, uh, if you need any more information, please reach out to me. Uh, I will meet with you. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton and Ms. Sullivan. Um, thank you. Um, I just, uh, from the Nova Scotia Health Authority, I just want to um, clearly um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of um, this um, public account session. I also just want to stress, you know, from a Nova Scotia Health Authority perspective, our partnership and collaboration with EHS are critical to the operation of the health system in Nova Scotia and the flow of patients throughout the system. From the Nova Scotia Health Authority, we are continuously trying to working towards change and improvements to address the challenges in our health system and will continue and commit to do so. I think the recent announcement with respect to the command center is a good step forwards and our working relationship with the HW and EHS and our other partners look Looking at opportunities to improve access to care across the health system for Nova Scotians. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our witnesses uh, here today. Um, and uh, you may now leave the meeting. You're free to go. We are going to conduct uh, committee business now, so you don't need to hang around for that. So thank you so much for coming uh, and spending time with us and informing us. Thank you. Now we'll move on to committee business. Um, we have correspondence uh, from Mr. Young to the chair dated February 10th and my response about the, the committee limits, but I did indicate to Mr. to Mr. Young that we could discuss uh, the issue going forward. We wouldn't have been able to do it today with the committee with the um, with the physical distancing requirements that are still um, underway at uh, at the house. So uh, does anyone have anything they would like to say on this particular matter? Mr. McGuire. Uh, can you just read the motion um, so we're clear on what it is? So there is no motion at this point. This was this is a matter for discussion. This was about uh, Mr. Mr. Young's uh, letter to me, um, wishing that today's particular uh, meeting would take place in person. But because of the number of witnesses, we would not have been able to to um, to do that. Um, and still be with, uh, have the proper uh, physical distancing. So uh, that is what the letter was about, uh, Mr. McGuire. So going forward, what I'm trying to understand, there's two, two questions that I have around this. One is, um, I think the original motion, and maybe this is something Mr. Hebb could talk to us about, was um, the original motion to go virtual was that we would, um, revert back to in person uh, with the direction of public health. Um, I'm wondering, um, was there any direction from public health to this committee to go back to in person? Um, because it seemed like the original motion took the, and that was my argument originally, 
was that it took the authority out of the committee's hands to make this decision. And it was something I argued with this committee. And now Mr. Young is making, trying to put a motion forward to make that decision, which I guess is contrary to the original motion. That's my first question. Um, my second question is that um, Excuse me, I'm just going to just, Mr. Begoy, I'm just going to interrupt for a minute. Mr. Mr. McMullen, you're no longer required for the meeting. You can leave. <laughs> Thank you so unless, much. <laughs> unless he wants to hear all the boring stuff. Unless he wants to hear all the boring stuff, yes. Um, uh, Mr. McGuire. So that, that's my first question. My first question is that the original motion said that we couldn't go back to in-person unless directed by public health. Um, and that was something that I argued in this committee. Um, so are we just throwing that motion out the door now um, that we all voted unanimous or that we voted for? Sorry. Secondly, my my other question is around what happens uh, if we get into another situation like today where we have uh, more witnesses than um, public health deems necessary, like deems that we can have in one room together. Um, are we just going to switch back and forth virtual and not, or is that something we're going to have to vote on every single time? So I will come to you, Mr. Young. I do see your hand up. Um, I, I do believe it was about public health direction, and I, I do believe that referred to the number of, of uh, people allowed in a certain space in terms of um, uh, physical distancing and that kind of thing. So I think that's what the motion referred to, but I could be wrong. So uh, perhaps... Um, the clerk could just uh, see if we can find what the what the uh, particular motion was, but I, I will go to, to Mr. Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Dr. Strain would have released our province's reopening plan uh, this week, and it allows for increased gathering limits beginning on Monday, February the 14th. Um, based on Dr. Strain's guidance and following public health protocols, it appears safe and appropriate for the PAC committee to resume meeting in person. And to Mr. McGuire's point, uh, it was another committee I was in yesterday, Veterans Affairs, where we talked about uh, the amount of people that would be able to be in a room at a time for witnesses. And there was some discussion around the possibility of a hybrid format for the witnesses, if, it, if need be. But I guess that'd be a discussion for this committee. Thank you. Um, Ms. LeBlanc. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, I, we in the NDP caucus are prepared to start meeting in person. So I think maybe we should put a motion on the table and uh, I can do that if you want. I move that uh, uh, given that uh, public health, we're in now phase one of the reopening uh, uh, plan that uh, the public health committee resumes meeting in person. Um, Ms. Langell, did you did you have anything that you wanted to add or you're, you're, you're fine there? She's she's looking she's looking for the original motion, but uh, Mr. McGuire. So there's a few questions on the floor. So before we vote on this, I'd just like to some answers. Mrs. Langell is looking for their original, um, and I'd just like to hear what the original uh, motion that was on the floor that we passed. Um, secondly, you know I agree um, that we should start meeting in person, but I will note that um, this past month. Uh, was the worst month uh, for COVID in our province's history. Uh, there was 35 deaths. Um, this month, we're tracking, unfortunately, to have an even worse month. Uh, as of a couple of days ago, we were at 19 deaths, and I'm, I'm, and our, we just heard from the paramedics and from the Department of Health that we are uh, the healthcare system is strained. So I would like to to note that that is something um, that we need to take uh, a look at also. But, you know, we I, I'm glad that we're meeting uh, in person. We have a, a, a very little information coming out about COVID, and that's that's kind of one of the disturbing things for us. Uh, for me personally, we have a premier that's be, uh, very seldomly me, um, meeting with uh, the public. Uh, he'd rather be on Oak Island or whatever that show there, he, you know, instead of giving us statistics and numbers, and when we were at an all time high for deaths in this province, instead of holding a press conference to discuss that and to comfort uh, Nova Scotians and 
have a direction put forward, uh, he decided to go on a TV show and, and smile for the cameras. Um, you know, a lot of Nova Scotians were extremely offended by that. Uh, that, you know, while they're searching for answers on COVID. Point of um, order. Point of order. Um, no, no, um, Madam talk, Speaker. Talk, run, Mr. Wire, talk to, your, talk to the relevant question. Madam Chair, that's point of order. Um, Ms. Mr. Ritzy, Mr. McGuire has the floor. Thank you. That's, that is not actually uh, relevant, what he said. I'm actually talking about it. Uh, I'm talking about COVID, which uh, is exactly what this motion is for. Um, but yeah, I, I just uh, would like to see um, us, I would like to see us meet in person, but I think we need to have options in place uh, with, with uh, on this motion um, to put the safety of the, more so I would say the, the witnesses than the members. I do know that there are members of public accounts that have family members that they live with that, um, are at high risk. Let's be honest, they're at high risk. Um, and I just would like to see the current government take this issue more seriously and um, be able to inform the public. As I stated earlier, you know, January, by all measures of COVID, was the worst month in this province history for hospitalizations and deaths. And we had a premier that spent 20 minutes in front of the public discussing it and an hour on TV smiling for the camera. So um, I would just like to know what that original emotion is from Ms. Langella. If she could give that to us, that'd be great. I believe um, that Ms. Langella is still looking for it. And uh, so she, with her apologies, uh, Mr. Young. I believe there's motion on the floor currently, and I know our Liberal member needs all the um, all the time to to talk about those important topics right now uh, with the public accounts. But we've always taken guidance from Dr. Strang, the same as the Liberals have taken guidance from Dr. Strang. With that said, there is a, a motion on the floor that we'd be prepared to vote on. I'd like to call the question. Uh, Mr. Ritzy, you had your hand up as well. No, I'm fine. I just, uh, I, I'd like to put the motion on the floor as well. Um, we have, the clerk is ready to speak and also Mr. McDonald. Uh, the clerk, Ms. Langell. So the motion, um, the previous motion was, I move that the Public Accounts Committee follow the lead of other committees and move virtually. Okay, so we didn't, there was no, uh, um, direction there about public uh, public uh, health direction changing. So, uh, Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. But I I was reading that I was about to let the the clerk know where it was in the pages, but she caught it before, so I'm okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Mr. McGuire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I see Mr. Ritzy reacting. Um, I do have the floor and I'm allowed to speak. Um, and that's all part of the democratic process here in Nova Scotia. Um, what I would like to say is that um, I, while I agree with the motion, I think we have to have uh, language in it uh, in case uh, we, we get back into a situation where we have to go virtual um, or we have to um, accommodate witnesses. Some of the confusion, and I'm being, I'm not trying to waste time here. I, I really mean this is like Mr. Young had stated earlier that, you know, uh, maybe doing something virtually if we have too many witnesses or things like that. And if Mr. Young could just add something like that to the, this motion, I, I'll gladly vote for it. But I think we have to accommodate, um, we have to be able to accommodate um, people that, uh, are in a situation where maybe still meeting publicly um, and taking it home could could impact their health and and the people around them, but also if we're going to go over the potential gathering limits. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, the, the clerk just read the previous motion and this motion obviously um, goes against that motion um, and that's fine. We, we we can put motions on the floor that contradict previous motions. That's the way it works. And so um, if it happens in the future that we get into another wave 
or we have too many witnesses for the gathering limits, we can put a motion on the floor and fix that issue. So I would respectfully say that this is a bunch of time wasting. Uh, it's exactly what the Public Accounts Committee should not be doing, which actually I will bring up further if we ever get to my motion in this meeting. Uh, and I say we just vote on this motion. It's a very simple thing to do. Um, Ms. Langell has her hand up. Ms. Langell. Oh, I just I just continued to review, and that was a motion that was put forward, but that was not the motion that Mr. Uh, Young put forward. So I'm still I'm still trying to find it. I'm sorry, Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would like the member from Dartmouth North, is it, to retract that statement? Um, I've heard her talk at this committee many times, um, and something, and and I don't appreciate her saying that. Uh, my concerns about COVID and gathering limits is a waste of time. Um, I think it's extremely disrespectful uh, for someone to say that, and I would appreciate if that statement was retracted. I'm still waiting on Ms. Langell's statement. I've told uh, all of you that there are concerns. Mr. Young had concerns, um, and I'm just following up on that. Thank you. I think we have, I think we have a motion on the floor, and so... Um... I would ask Ms. LeBlanc to uh, to read her motion so we all know what we're voting on and we don't have any confusion. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that going forward, we, can, we begin meeting as Public Accounts Committee uh, in person. Thank you. Mr. McGuire. Sorry, Ms. Langell had her hand up first and then I'll go. Ms. Langell? Uh, yeah, I found it. My apologies. Um, the motion was that the Standing Committee on Public Accounts move to a virtual format until Public Health, Health recommends otherwise. And that motion was carried. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Is it, Madam Chair, do we vote on this first or is it possible to put an amendment to it before we vote? So when we when um, there's a motion, uh, it belongs to the house. You can't withdraw it. You can't revise it either. You'd no, no, the current one. It. The current I one. I understand. I'm Sorry. Um, in terms of amendments, you members vote twice: first on whether to amend the motion, and then on the motion it, itself. So a member could propose a motion, uh, an amendment to the motion. We would discuss that, then we would vote on whether to accept the amendment, and then, and then, and then, if if we accepted to vote on the amendment, um, then we would move on to the amended motion, depending on whether it passed or didn't. Mr. McGuire. So I just want to put a quick amendment on the floor. I'm actually not going to talk about it, so we can get this vote through. Um, my amendment would be that uh, if we, we we do know that witnesses coming forward and how many there's going to be, that we vote previously, maybe the week before, uh, via email to ensure that um, uh, if we need to go virtual, we can so that it doesn't take up committee time. So my amendment is uh, looking at the witnesses list, if we know it's over capacity, that we vote beforehand um, via email uh, so that it doesn't take up committee time. Mr. McDonald? I just want to question through you, Madam Chair, if with the word vote, that means majority, not unanimous, correct? Oh, that, is, yeah. that is correct. Oh, uh, Ms. Ms. Langell is waving her hand. Yep, Ms. Langell. If it's done by email, Paul, it has to be unanimous. Okay. Oh, well. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Young. Uh, we will be supporting uh, Ms. LeBlanc's original motion. Uh, just wanted to, to state that. Thank you. So we have uh, we have an amendment on on the floor. Um, we're not going to have any further discussion, is my understanding, on the amendment. Um, so I'm now asking members to vote I'm on whether to, vote. whether to accept the amendment. Uh, and so we're just voting on whether to amend the original motion. So recorded vote, please. 
Yes, I heard that, Mr. McGuire. So Ms. Langell will we'll, uh, call the roll, and this is whether or not to amend the original motion to include the possibility of an email vote if the number of witnesses exceed um, allowable limits. Um, Mr. Young. No to the amendment. Mr. Ritzy. No to the amendment. Mr. McDonald. No. Ms. Sheehy Richard. No. Mr. Boudreaux. No. Honorable McGuire. Yes. Ms. Chender. No. Ms. LeBlanc. No. And Honorable Reagan. Regan. Yes. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Two, four, seven against. And so the amendment uh, is defeated. Mr. McGuire. So the question I, I have for Mr. Young um, is how does he want to deal with um, witnesses that would be over gathering limits? Does he want to deal with it during committee and, and take up valuable committee time or uh, does he have another recommendation? Mr. Young, do you want to speak to that? I believe Ms. Chender has her hand up. Ms. Chender? Uh, okay, so with all due respect, this committee has become dysfunctional and we should absolutely be able to deal with it during committee time. We should be able to put a motion on the floor and vote on it and then accept the outcome of that vote and move on. Uh, there's no reason to put this to an email vote where it has to be unanimous uh, versus a simple vote in committee. If we are all here doing our jobs, those votes should not go this way every time. Um, Mr. McGuire, you in particular uh, insisted that we all meet in person by uh, voting against a unanimous poll. Uh, you know, some weeks ago when COVID was just as bad as it is now. So I, this is absurd. Um, I think we need to follow public health instructions. I think the original motion uh, that we passed around meeting um, virtually was overbroad, which we talked about at the time. Uh, now we're going back. And I think, you know, we can make this, we're all grownups. We can make this decision. We can have a vote in committee. We can discuss it and we can vote on it and we can move on. That's, those are, our, that's our job. That's what we're sent here to do. And with all due respect, I think we should do it. So I'd like to vote on the original, the motion that's on the floor, which is to go back to in-person meetings. And if there's a problem with that, then we can deal with it because that's our job. Mr. McGuire. With all due respect to Ms. Tender, uh, I did vote for it. That's why we're here unanimously. Uh, so uh, there was some issues in the beginning. Those issues were solved. Um, but uh, secondly, uh, I call the question and I would like a recorded vote. Mr. Young, you had your hand up. Can we vote or do you want to make a comment? Question. Okay. So I will ask uh, Ms. LeBlanc to reiterate her, her motion. So we have that and we know what we're voting on. It may be worded uh, differently for the third time, Madam Chair, because I never wrote it down, but I move that we begin mo uh, meeting in person as a public accounts committee going forward. Um, Mr. McGuire, you asked for a recorded vote, is that correct? Uh, so to the clerk, please go through the list. Um, Mr. Young. Yes. Mr. Ritzy. Yes. Mr. McDonald. Yes. Ms. Sheehy Richard. Yes. Mr. Boudreau. Yes. Honorable McGuire. Yes. Ms. Chender. Yes. Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. Honorable Regan. Yes. Now we are at 10.59. Uh, could we extend uh, the committee, Ms. LeBlanc? Yes, please, madam. I move that we extend the committee for 10 minutes. Um, it, this does not have to be unanimous, is my understanding. Those those in favor of the motion, no, we don't even have to vote, do we? We just look for, it for uh, confirmation. It's been a while since I did this one, sorry. 
If there's a motion, um, you should vote on it. You can just do it by unanimous consent. But there's a motion, you can vote on it if you want. I'm 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 seeing um, there is a motion. We'll vote on the motion. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by raising your hand. Uh, does that the mean motion the, motion? Is, the motion is defeated? Madam it Chair. is now 11 o'clock. Uh, the meeting has come to an end. Uh, just so folks, we have some correspondence that we were not able to deal with this, this particular meeting, but we will uh, push them forward to our next meeting, which is on February 23rd, 2022. The witness will be the Department of Community Services, Rechild Protection Services case notes. Madam Chair. Mr. Uh, Mr. McGuire. The vote, the, and then I know the, the committee's over, but so I'm going to ask Mr. Heb this. But so, that so, so, Mr. McGuire, the meeting is over, and you can, we are now going to adjourn the meeting, okay. and you can have a conversation with Mr. Heb offline. Thank you. The meeting is over.